Hey there, welcome to the extended entity relationship model part two. So in this follow on to the initial EER video, uh, I want to touch on two things. First, I want to talk about the implications of the direction from which you come at the EER model. Um, EER is a enhancement that allows us to pursue superclasses and subclasses through the process of inheritance. Okay? And we get to the superclasses and subclasses through one or the other of two closely related processes. Namely, uh, we generalize or we specialize. Generalize is a bottom up process and specialize is a top down. Now they amount to exactly the same thing and are basically two sides of the same coin. However, another thing that I want to do in this video is review for you the constraints involved in the EER. They are somewhat related to the constraints of the traditional entity relationship model. We've got something relating and analogous to participation, and we have something related and analogous to cardinality. And the connection between those constraints and where you start the process is something that I want to review. Because whether you are generalizing from the bottom up or specializing from the top down will have implications on the resultant constraints that you see in your model. And uh, if that doesn't make sense just yet, uh, that's okay. I think that a couple of concrete examples will make that clear. So let's go through those at this point. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so say we're starting granular uh, and we're brainstorming specific entity classes and just say we got, all right, we got, we say we have cars, so we have a car entity and truck and motorcycle and what the heck boat and we know that we want all of these entities and that all of these entities are important to our problem domain and we sit and we take a look at those and we say you know what there's some commonality in these entities and we think we could represent this through a subclass superclass relationship and we would like to generalize from the bottom up we are generalizing these subclasses up to a common superclass and we say that the superclass will be vehicle because there are some attributes that all of these vehicles have and they share them in common and then there are things specific to the subclasses that we started with in the first place. So the reason this process is generalization as opposed to specialized specialization is we started at the bottom and we rolled up instead of the other way around. So vehicles can have uh, let's say a vehicle identification number and they can have you know maximum miles per hour they can have fuel economy as measured in miles per gallon they could have uh, engine types uh, horsepower of the engine types, and so on and so forth. And we could say a car has all these things, a truck has all these things, motorcycle and boat. And a car will have trim level in addition to those things in a way that these other categories will not. For sake of argument, I suppose it could be argued that a truck has trim level and so forth, but um, just as illustration, Cars would have trim level and, and other things related to them. Truck 
let's say, towing capacity that is specific to trucks and not relevant to any of the others, motorcycle will be, I don't know what off the top of my head, but if you're more familiar with motorcycles than I, perhaps you could identify a set of attributes that would be specific to motorcycles. Uh, and then boat, um, we'll say motorcycle is motorcycle type and uh, boat would be uh, boat type as well. And the exact nature of the specific attributes is not terribly, terribly important, although I suppose I should have researched this a little better. What is important is what the fact that we started down here means in terms of our constraints. So we've got the equivalent of a participation constraint and the equivalent of a cardinality constraint. We don't have any good solid terminology for these things. Participation is at minimum and it will remain at minimum here and cardinality is at max. And for at minimum, we still have same terminology as we did before we extended the entity relationship model, either full or partial, right? And for the cardinality at max, this boils down to either disjoint or overlap. Okay. So the question we ask ourselves regarding participation first, does a vehicle have to participate in at least one of these categories? And given that we started with these individual things in our design process, and then and only then generalized up to the vehicle, it is quite likely, probably inescapable, that vehicle does in fact require participation in one of the subclasses, given that we the nature of how we got to vehicle, which was by generalizing these pre-existing more specific entity categories. So generalization implies mandatory participation in the subclasses, okay? Similarly, in terms of at maximum, given that these were the real things that we started with, it is unlikely that we can have a, an instance of the generalized superclass that has at maximum more than one of these categories because the categories preceded the generalized vehicle. So we would say this is almost definitely or really inescapably a disjoint constraint because these categories stand on their own and pre-existed the generalized vehicle category. Now, you could certainly just argue from your own experience um, that there are hybrids of these two things, right? Whether you're from my era and you say, oh yeah, you've got to have an El Camino, you can't. You can't ignore the El Camino, it must be reckoned with. Uh, or if you are somewhat younger, uh, the car hybrid, the car truck hybrids like the Honda CRV sports utility vehicle and so forth. But in any case, we are not accommodating that in this design. Were we to want to do that, we could add a crux or however you want to represent car truck hybrids as one of these categories or it is possible although it's rather sophisticated we could generalize these up to a actually no nope, i'm going to say that is not a good idea in any case if we wanted to deal with that sort of hybrid we would need to represent that hybrid as a separate category given the nature of the process of generalization. Okay, so let's do a briefer example of the constraint implications of specializing.
because those are different. Okay, for our specialization example, let's use a university or college setting, uh, one near and dear to my heart, of course. And let's say we are dealing with people. Okay, that's our broad category. And we know that people share some attributes we are interested in. Some sort of identifier, uh, name, which we'll break down to first and last. Contact info, which we'll break down to email, address, telephone number, date of birth, gender, etc. Okay? And so we start breaking down people. And we say, all right, we've got some categories of people. And the first one will be employees. The other one will be and we should start with this one because it's clearly most important, but I want to put it in the middle. Students. I always struggle with making these plural or not. We'll make it, we'll make it plural. And then we have alumni. Okay. So first question, do the people have to participate in one or more of these categories. And here, this is really more a business decision. It could go either way, probably. Uh, we could easily say, if these were our three subcategories, no, no, this must be optional because there are other people we are interested in. There are other constituencies that would be in this people database. Uh, legislators, trustees, uh, we could easily argue that. Or we could say, this is a database that really only concerns itself with employees of the institution, students of the institution, and former students of the institution. So we can put a question mark here and make this go either way, really in accordance with the purposes to which we are going to put this system, and that is not terribly, terribly interesting. What is critically important to take note of is it could go either way if you are starting from the more general and decomposing. Could be mandatory, could be optional. Could be at most zero, or at least zero, could be at least one. What is very apparent here, however, is that this is not a disjoint constraint, but rather an overlapping one. Because certainly there will be some employees who are students, particularly if the institution affords the ability to study for free to its employees. And uh, especially if we offer any sort of graduate programs, students and alumni will overlap. I could be an alumni uh, class of uh, 1999 for my bachelor's, but I could be a current student in the MBA program. For that matter, those two things could be the case, and I could work in uh, the Office of Student Affairs, and I could belong to all three categories simultaneously. So I'm just making these. That's This has nothing to do with the fact that it's overlapping, these little U's are just a standard part of the specialization generalization representation. And the bottom line to remember here is you have far more flexibility in the constraints when you are engaging in the process of specialization than you do when you are rolling up to a generalization because these categories may not cover the entire universe of possible people categories, and that's okay. And also take note, well, and the other is that it's quite likely if you are starting with the more general that your cardinality is at most many, and thus this specialization is an overlapping one and you can have people who belong to these multiple categories. The other thing to take note of that this example illustrates well is that there is nothing preventing further decomposition. You can have sub subclasses. So people, we decompose, decompose to employee. Employee, we could then decompose to 
faculty, staff, and administration. And we can imagine attributes related to faculty could be discipline, staff could be department, administration could be some sort of grade, and we could go on. And you could decompose faculty to contingent or adjunct faculty and full-time faculty. You could decompose staff in a variety of ways, administration as well. You could account for the fact that it's even possible that some of your staff are alumni and students, your faculty are alumni as well, and so forth. These sorts of hierarchies can have multiple levels. I think that is as far as we need to go with our discussion of generalization, specialization, inheritance, superclasses, subclasses, except critically to go through the process of translating an EER model to a set of relational schema and thus to tables. Without that, it's not terribly interesting to draw these pretty pictures. So stay tuned for that. Study hard, and I'll uh, see you online.